Good morning. Ooh, that was loud. I am so impressed, Karen. You actually remembered all that. That's uh, pretty impressive. And for those of you that know Spud, my therapy dog, he's actually more popular than I am. So whenever I have him, people are jumping to see him and pet him, and I get least amount of tension. Um, skinny love. It was really interesting as I was getting dressed today. I thought I'm putting on my skinny jeans. I am wearing probably the skinniest color I can think of in my... Um, in my repertoire, and um, you know, every once in a while, well, I should backtrack a minute. Um, probably in the next two or three months, I'm speaking on this topic maybe four times, and it's been really interesting me, to me because people who have asked me to speak at some uh, mom and tot groups, to some women's breakfasts, to some church events, this is the topic they keep coming back to, and I've just found it really fascinating that without any prompting, these are the issues that um, people want to hear about, which says a lot, doesn't it? Um, one of these days I'll be brave enough that I'll actually go in wearing pajamas or something so anticlimactic to, to body image issues, but I haven't worked my, my bravery up to that yet. So let's think about this a minute. Um, one of the things this morning you'll hear about most is really what, what leads to this struggle. What are we dealing with and why and what are some of the cultural values? And the hope is that's really talk about how scripture talks about the image we should be pursuing. You also have to understand the graven image, right? The false image that's before us and what we tend to buy into. I love to, th uh, to think about how this works with this kind of metaphor. Um, so one of the things I'm going to talk about is how culture uh, feeds this, feeds this desire or need or this deficit that we seem to see in ourselves. And a great example I have that I had to live out was years ago I was traveling somewhere to speak and it was about a three or four hour um, commute I had in the car. I got up in the morning and I love coffee, um, especially cappuccinos. So Starbucks is one of my top places to stop. I got up in the morning, I got dressed, I got in the car and went and uh, started driving and you know, you get on the highway and how long does it take before you see a Starbucks sign, right? So I see a Starbucks sign and wasn't phased by it at all. I'm like, oh, I love, I love cappuccino. Um, I just ate breakfast, I just had coffee, I don't need it. And then five miles down the road, there is another rest stop, and there's another Starbucks sign, and I ignore it. And then five more miles, and all of a sudden, I saw this slow decline of uh, willpower. And by the third time, fourth time I saw it, I'm like, oh, a cappuccino really does sound good. And then by the fifth time, I'm going, well, if I see one more Starbucks sign, I'll take it as a sign to stop. <laughs> really. And so by the fifth or the sixth Starbucks, I was convinced I need to stop and pull over and get myself a coffee. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that how um, advertisement works? And I'll talk about that in a minute. But we, we tend to see things. We tend to get pictures or glimpses. We tend to have images, uh, images before us that convince us that they sell not only um, products, but they sell values, they sell morals, they sell... Um, perspectives on romance and love and attractiveness and morality. And so we need to understand that we buy into a culture that is telling us how to live. And if you don't see the image, the graven image in that, then it'll be really hard to see the image that we need to really be portraying. So that's everything I have to say in a nutshell for the day. You can all leave. Um, Let's look at what some of those things might be. So when we talk about body image issues, probably one of the things that we see or think of immediately would be eating disorders, right? Unfortunately, it starts well before an eating disorder and that we probably to some degree all can understand, not can, we do have to struggle with and understand the issues of body image before us. So here's multiple ways it can look. Um, from anywhere to eating disorders or disorderly eating might be a better way to say it, to the struggles with um, success, materialism, plastic surgery, addictive dieting, unrealistic standards we put on ourselves. And again, what we see culturally is more and more options for us to try to maintain or to try to gain this unrealistic ideal. So the question is, where do you and I fall into this mix? 
how do we how do we understand the effect on us? So let's think about it for a minute. How does it touch each of us? So do you ever avoid social situations because people may critique your appearance? Do you have a love-hate relationship with food or exercise or weight or the mirror? Invest a great deal of time or money on clothing, makeup, salon visits, protein powders, diet supplements. Do you worry about having gray hair, straight hair, thick hair, or no hair? Do you ever struggle with feeling good enough, attractive enough, successful enough, valued enough? Or do you ever wonder what it would be like to free from thinking about such things? How do you find yourself in the midst of this struggle? In what ways does it manifest in your life or in your thought life? And again, there is this um, sense that it's obvious when somebody struggles with, with eating or when someone struggles with body image issues. But my, my premise is we are all struggling with it to some degree or other. And with social media, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, it is all about appearance, right? Even if that appearance is a certain kind of image and not your physical appearance, what does it look like? What are the lies you and I are buying into? So think about it for a minute. There's two analogies I'd like to give you. One is this idea of um, having a mirror before you. So you guys know those handheld mirrors. Imagine walking around all day long with that mirror placed in front of you. And all day long, everything you do in some way is being reflected back on you. Another picture is also living in a room full of mirrors that you walk around and all day long, everything and everyone uh, around you is really reflecting on you. And what does that do to somebody when they live in a room full of mirrors? Does it shape the way I feel about myself, myself today? Does it inform how I believe others see me? To what degree does it alter my actions and my behavior? So let's take exercise for a minute. Any healthy person should want some level of exercise, right? Nothing wrong with that. Healthy eating, paying attention to good hygiene. Um, I have four teenagers in the house right now, and I can't tell you how hard it is to get them to pay attention to hygiene. What does it look like um, to say these things are a part of life? And when does it cross over to being concerning? Well, like I say here, it, the issue is not the behavior itself. It's the degree to which it dictates our worth, right? So where is our value found? Where is our worth found? Versus what does it look like to be stewardships of the life, of the body, of uh, the gifts God has given us, and how do we live it out well? So the key over and over again is what is the degree to which it dictates our value and our worth, that I put value and worth into these things? The mirrors we build. So think for a minute, if you're living in a room full of mirrors, what happens? There is nowhere you can turn on a day-to-day -day basis that is not reflecting back on you. So what does that mean? It means we can only see others through the lens in which they see us. So I cannot possibly stand up here today and interact with you if all I'm thinking about is, what are you guys thinking of me? What are they thinking of Julie Lowe right now? How are they thinking about my presentation? How are they thinking about my appearance? Everything becomes consumed with what you all are thinking about me versus what does love look like? How can you truly be known by me if I'm living in a room full of mirrors that the stakes are so high that everything you think reflects back on me, right? So that's what body image issues do, or that's what the obsession with appearance or image, a false image, a graven image, a personal image can do is it means I am always engaging with people to the degree to which they will like me, accept me, embrace me, or see me. There's that room full of mirrors, right? It all reflects back. It enslaves us to an image or what others think of my image. Social media is a great picture of that happening, right? It prevents us from being known or knowing others. It's because when you have that mirror right in front of your right in front of yourself, right in front of your face, it means I'm not seeing the people behind it, nor am I really letting you know me because the stakes are high if you know my weaknesses or my, the cracks and holes in my life, right? It destroys relationship. It separates you from me. We become obsessed with self, and there's no room or concern for others. That's the extreme of it. We seek to be admired more than known. 
And again, how many times in the church do we struggle with this? We fear letting walls down. We fear really being genuinely known because we fear being rejected. So it goes back to this where identity, where value is found in, in our relationships and in our lives. Let me stop there for a minute. I want to give you another way of looking at this. So let me show you a video clip. I always thought people were so cute and they have the little cheeks and they're like rosy, but mine are pretty plain. If I was going to change one feature about my face, I would say that I would want fuller lips. I'm definitely a person that looks tired when I'm tired, and when people say that, I immediately I'm like, oh man. I'm starting to already get little crow's feet and stuff, which like my mom has, so yeah. I'm a forensic artist. I was trained at the FBI Academy in 1993 in composite art. Worked for the San Jose Police Department as the police artist from 1995 to 2011. We didn't really know what we were doing, so that was nerve wracking for everyone. I showed up to a place I had never been and walked into this big warehouse. And at the very end, there was a guy with his back to me with a drafting board. I had a curtain separating me so that I don't see him. Uh, we'll begin. First of all, tell me about your hair. Um, brown, long, I guess a little bit past my shoulders. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. Yeah, they're brown eyebrows, dark brown eyebrows. Okay. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. I guess I haven't really compared it to anyone else's chin, but um, especially when like I smile, I just feel like it kind of protrudes a little bit. Hmm. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. You sort of realize, oh man, now I, I have to talk about myself and, and, and think about my looks. I'm 40, so I'm starting to get a little bit of the crow's feet thing going on. Um. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. I still didn't know. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin was a nice, thin chin. Mm. The women were really critical about moles or scars or things like that. And yet, they were describing just a normal, beautiful person. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke and were very expressive. The length of the nose, what is that like? A short. Short. Yeah, cute nose. Her face was fairly thin. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. OK. So here we go. Hmm. So this is your self-described image? And then somebody else described you and I did this sketch. This whole thing about having dark circles and crow's feet around my eyes and that was not part of the sketch at all that the stranger did. The stranger's was a little more like gentle. That's pretty different. She looks closed off and fatter. She just looks kind of shut down. Looks sadder, too. The second one is more beautiful. You think they're catching more of that from you? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. She looks more open and um, friendly and happy. I've come a long way in how I see myself, but I think I still have oh, some way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have some work to do on myself. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. Chloe's perception was so, so clearly different. Her picture looked like somebody I thought I would want to talk to and be friends with, like a happy, light, much younger, much brighter person. It's troubling. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Our self-perceptions are generally kind of harsh and unbecoming when really that's not how the world sees us. spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right and we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. So what's the point of me showing that to you? Um, there's lots of ways to think about this, and I'll, I'll probably loop back around to it. But let me start with this. So we're using the imagery of we're using the imagery of mirrors. So let's add another one. Another image is that of carnival mirrors. How many of you guys have ever seen the carnival mirrors? Hopefully, you all know what I'm talking about, right? So. It's not just that we can get caught up way too much in what people think of us. And the reality is sometimes people might even see us accurately. Um, but we more than often than not, not only are obsessed with what people are thinking about us, but we're also looking in a carnival mirror. And we know those carnival near, mirrors never accurately reflect us. Um, you know, those mirrors can make you look short and five feet wider or thin and five feet taller. Um, and many of the times what this uh, commercial video represents is the tendency that we look at ourselves, we're not even looking at ourselves accurately, but through the lens of a carnival mirror that distorts us, that exaggerates what we see as flaws or weaknesses or our fears of what others might think of us. And understanding that there are, there are several factors here for us. One is that we're often not even seeing ourselves accurately. Um, the second that this video really doesn't describe well is that it really isn't up to others to accurately reflect us, is it? And so where we go to, to find the accurate image in our lives really matters. And this is where scripture comes in. This is where the standard that the Lord gives us, he is really the only source of reflecting accurately who we are and changing that and morphing it into something redemptive and beautiful. Let's see, Jean Kilborn, if you've never heard of her before, she tends to write a lot of documentaries, um, produces a lot of documentaries, I should say. She's really well known in speaking out about uh, against the cultural images used for women and against women. And she started a series, um, this is years ago now, ki called Killing Us Softly, and she did a video series, a documentary on cultural images and how women are portrayed in um, culture. She has since then done uh, Killing Us Softly 2, Killing Us Softly 3, and she's now on Killing Us Softly 4. And what she does is she walks through how over the years imagery of women and how it's portrayed uh, produces certain kinds of um, perspectives and social issues. So let me talk about you through that for a minute. So in 1979, uh, it was research. The company spent about $20 billion on advertising. As you see here, 
1999, companies spent over $180 billion. What does that tell you? And we're now in 2019, so imagine what the number is, right? What it tells you is advertising works. Um, the average American views 3,000 advertisements in a day. That can be anywhere from driving uh, past a billboard to the commercials you watch to all kinds of things. Uh, advertising is the foundation of the mass media. The primary purpose of the mass media is to sell products. So I've heard it said, don't really know how accurate, but I've heard it said that even shows sometimes exist really for the commercials that the commercials are what people are being um, wooed to, and the need to purchase, buy, to be um, engulfed in a, a materialistic um, sense of purpose. So advertising sells not only products, she says, but also values, images, concepts of love and sexuality, romance, success, and normalcy. In recent years, computer retouching has become a primary technique for advertisers. So it used to be that before photographs were published, they digi digitally retouch them. So even, and you hear this all the time with supermodels, that they look at the magazine that they're on and go, that's not me either. They've been so changed and reshaped and flaws taken away that they know that they can't live up to their own ideal. However, now it is that you can pull out any woman's magazine and you can look at the model that is on the magazine cover and it's not even a real person. And what they've done is they've taken the eyes of one person and created somebody. They've taken the hair and the complexion of another. They've created the, uh, the lips and the nose um, and it's not a person that even exists. But yet this is the image that's put out there for you and I that we should be aspiring to. That's our ideal of beauty. Something that doesn't even exist, that has to be created out of nothing. So what do we do with that? What's her point? Well, here's some more things that she says. The perfect North American fashion model is 5'8 and weighs 115 pounds. However, the average North American woman is 5'3 and weighs how much? 144 pounds. I think they did, you guys might have heard this, but I think they've done, um, I forget what it called, but kind of remodeling of the Barbie doll. And if Barbie was a really alive woman, she would fall over regularly because she'd be so top heavy that she couldn't really walk. <laughs> That's true, I didn't make that up. You can Google it somewhere. Um, so the average North American woman is 5'3 and weighs 144 pounds. But what are we told the ideal is? Somebody who's a good five inches taller than us and how many pounds later? Almost 30 pounds. Now the interesting thing in the Killing Us Softly series, if you were to watch them, and you can go online actually on YouTube and you'll see clips of them, if not more full length, um, she goes through and she shows picture after picture how over the years, and she started in maybe the 1960s, how over the years she kept thinking models couldn't get any thinner, and yet they do. And the models that now represent our fashion industry are anorexic, and some of them dying of anorexia, yet we're holding that out as the ideal of beauty. What is wrong with us? The message given to women by the fashion, diet, and media industries is that we're never good enough. We must constantly deprive ourselves and continually fight the natural size of our bodies. So in a very neat way, there are campaigns out there and people out there that are trying to fight up against it. One of the hard things about this topic is when I think we talk theoretically. And there is this struggle of the images that are out there. And so even when I speak, sometimes I struggle with how many times do I want to flash up the images that you and I face on a regular basis and how helpful or unhelpful is that? And I actually, I lean towards thinking it's helpful because um, it's very easy for us to talk and say, oh yeah, we shouldn't buy into that. But when we're faced with an image, how easily you and I envy it, right? Or we say, oh yeah, that person's way too skinny, but I really wish I had their eyes, or I really wish, and we catch ourselves wanting to emulate something about that image. And I think it's really important sometimes that we're able to look at those things face to face, if not for you and I, for the next generation. We are raising a culture of young people that are obsessed with self in so many regards. And again, I don't like bashing on social media because I think there could be very positive things at it, but unfortunately from a counseling standpoint, that's not what I see. 
What I see regularly from a counseling standpoint are young people and college age student and seminary people and sometimes older women who struggle regularly with um, presenting themselves in a way the world will accept them, with being obsessed with how many people like me and how many people comment on me and what kind of attention it brings. There's that mirror again. As social media becomes the mirror for through which I know whether I'm valued or not by the world around me. And it's that graven image that will always dissatisfy us. So if you and I aren't facing that and battling some of that, how are we going to lead the next generation? So again, you have the media that promotes this biologically unattainable ideal. Then you have a diet industry that comes in and they promise to deliver it. If you just take these diet pills, if you just go on this diet, and how many diets exist out there today that aren't also promoting protein powders and drinks and certain foods for you to eat? So there's an industry that is making money off of you feeling like you're not good enough. Food then becomes a tempting taboo. Think about this for a minute, um, and I might be jumping ahead here, but food is a God-given good thing. It's meant for nourishment and sustenance, and there's this theme in scripture that I love where food actually is about fellowship and community and relationship. What the culture does with that, though, is it uses language to describe food as, food as if sinful or tempting or taboo. So something very God-given and meant to be good becomes corrupted by our culture. And you and I buy into it, that food is something that we should fight against rather than something meant to be for nourishment and sustenance and even fellowship in our life. Now we've had plastic surgery that's up the, the stakes of perfection. So dieting can only take us so far, right? Dieting pills can only do so much, but now we have a better answer. Now we can actually reshape your face and your body and change things and expand things and shrink things in ways that make you ideal. So we can see how an image then creates an allure to what we value. Um, if tomorrow women woke up and decided they really liked their bodies, just think how many industries would go out of business. I like that. So where does it all lead? Obsession with appearance or the anxiety, the fear of other people, social anxieties, all kinds of things. How will people perceive me? Leads to what we know to be the extreme eating disorders, peer pressure to look or act a certain way, on a rare occasion, there are people that think they are all that, right? And that they're uh, goddesses. Obsession with perfection, that I must be perfect and nothing less. And in certain cultures, certainly those that tend to have more money, you, you, do, see, um, you do see this growing trend of even uh, 12th graders who, for graduation gifts, their parents are giving them breast augmentations or giving them surgical procedures as gifts to make them feel better about themselves before they go to college. There's a sacrificing of personal convictions. You see materialism on the rise. The giving in to sexual pressure to be accepted, uh, the polar opposite of self-hatred, self-injury, cutting, Depression, hopelessness, and despair always brings me back to Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. When we turn to the world to find our identity and value, what does it produce in us? So let me talk about Dove. How many of you guys are familiar with the global study Dove did years ago? There are some great commercials. I'm going to show you a few throughout the day. Um, but they came up with something in 2005 called Beyond Stereotypes and did this comprehension, comprehensive 10 country study, as you see here. So this was the Dove company. They wanted to explore self-esteem and the impact of beauty ideals on both women um, and girls. And do I say here what the ages were? I think the ages were, yeah, 15 to 64. About 3,300 girls and women. They also did it globally, so they went to Brazil, Canada, China, Germany, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And what were their findings? Really fascinating. It's still online if you ever want to Google it. They found that 90% of all women 
wanted to change at least one aspect of their physical appearance, with body weight ranking the highest. 67% of those women said they withdrew from life-engaging activities due to feeling badly about their looks. So things like uh, not giving an opinion, not going to school, not going to the doctor. 67% of women, due to how they felt about their appearance, withdrew from life-engaging activities. That is really telling. And it's not just a Western struggle, right? The other interesting thing about this study is that they broke it down from country to country, saying what they valued most or least. And two things really stood out. That countries and certain cultures wanted the exact opposite of what they were. So if they had really light skin, they wanted darker skin. If they had really dark skin, they wanted lighter skin. Um, if they tended to be really tall, they wanted to be shorter and petite. If they tended to be short, they wanted to be taller and thinner. Uh, blue eyes wanted brown eyes, dark hair. It's really fascinating to see that we wanted the opposite of what we had. The second thing that really stood out about this is there were cultural values too. So wealthier cultures valued wealth, right? Um, or more attractive cultures or more successful cultures value success as a priority and the image that they needed to strive for. All that makes sense. So what that speaks to is again, we tend to look at what we see as deficits or what we don't have, and we want to start, and we tend towards valuing them. Then we also buy into cultural values that tell us what is important or not important. So what do they get right? So you have documentaries like Killing Us Softly, you have people speaking out, you have the Dove campaign that back in 2005, they start producing all these commercials and they started to produce this really big campaign against uh, what culture tried to define as body images, body image struggles and redefining it. They started using models that were heavier, that were more natural, that were different sizes and shapes, different ages, redefining beauty in ways that made it natural and more realistic. And guess what happened? Over two years, their, um, their funding went down. Or what should I say? The amount of money they made went down. It didn't go up. What does that tell you? Women actually were not accepting that message. They wanted the unattainable ideal. And Dove was losing money by running this campaign rather than by benefiting from it. Isn't that fascinating? It can tell you the strength of a movement, the strength of a pull in our lives and how we buy into that. But what do they get right? So. The standard of beauty is unrealistic and even potentially harmful. In the Killing Us Softly videos, they demonstrate how uh, women's bodies are often used to sell products. So they show a woman's body in the shape of a, a wine bottle or a beer bottle. They show a woman's body in the shape of a car. Um, so what it's doing is it's even taking women and images of women and it's objectifying them, which a lot of research shows that that's the next step towards violence towards women. Now, what used to be a primarily struggle in um, objectification of women now is equally being an objectification of men. We're seeing more and more that men's bodies and uh, the commercials towards men are equally doing the same thing, which is not what we're going for, right? Women and men become objects. That's the dehumanizing that often, often as I just said, leads to justifying of violence. Um, and again, the, the object of someone else's pleasure rather than mutual relationship. The challenges, it challenges media to represent more diverse and natural and authentic images of people. You see many women that do try to fight back. And one of the things that got lost in the Dove study was that they acknowledged the need for positive relationships and role models, particularly mothers and daughters. So really interesting thing. So here's a company that is selling products to women. They want to get a better perspective on what women think about themselves and their body images. And what they weren't expecting is the call for better mentoring between mothers and daughters. That is really fascinating because it goes back to things that you and I should naturally already know, right? That relationships matter. They make a difference. Let me try to give you another example of that. I worry that she's inherited, um, oh gosh.
My number one hate on my body is my eyes are wonky. My bingo arms. I have very big legs. I'm not keen on my legs, but I just try to focus on the fact that they're very strong and that I'm a very good runner. I have a belief that mm, the fact that I smile a lot has a lot to do with why my skin stays yeah, nice. Sorry. We don't like our eyes. Oh, she said her thighs too, didn't she? She said her legs. We both don't like our nose. I think don't like my arms, and she doesn't like her arms either. So I've put hips and sort of bum areas, sort of upper thighs, and Lily's put her legs as well. I have tried to make my girls feel good. Well, I did say to her, I don't like this thing of, you know, these body parts of mine, and I think that's why she probably picked it up. Yeah, looking at it, she really picks up a lot of my ways. She does. Just be confident with yourself and how... Just realise how um, you can influence your child. Have a look. Look at those things that I like. Hips. <laughs> bum. Yeah, I do like my bum. I like my face because it's smiley. Legs. You wrote legs. Why do you like your legs? Because they go for running. Really? Uh -huh. So why you like them? Self-worth and beauty, it is an echo. It can echo from me to them, and then from them to others. Be happy. Just be happy. <laughs> how I feel about myself really affects how she feels about herself. Why do you like your mole then? Again, because isn't that interesting to watch how unknowingly our views of ourselves impact those around us? Let me make that a little broader too. I would argue that happens with you and I as well. So whether you live with roommates, whether you live within your peer group, whether you live within a small group at church, how much does your conversations revolve around the things you dislike about yourself? How much do those things influence the women around you unknowingly? So what does it look like to live honestly with our strengths, our weaknesses, the things that create insecurities in us versus when do we breed that in others? When, do, when are we aware that our own struggles sometimes create struggles in other people and what do we do about that? It's a great question to be asking. So you have all these cultural um, movements that are trying to inform in healthier ways body image and women's ideals. Why is it not enough? Well, in the biggest sense, it's void of God. It's just godless, meaning God's not anywhere in the picture. So true beauty and success stems from his standards of these things. Identity, image, value, all have to stem from the creator. So if you take that out, then will we ever come to the right conclusions? Any agenda for change must focus on the thoughts and desires of their heart. That at a lot of... Um, at the foundation of a lot of these movements is still this mentality of self-actualization, that you and I deserve good for ourselves now, right? That we deserve happiness, good circumstances, a good positive self-image. So I'm pursuing good esteem or good self-esteem for the sake of making myself better. It's still this inward focus. So another way of saying that is not the internal, but uh, it's not the internal, but no, it's the internal, I'm getting flustered. The internal, not the external, but even far greater is it's really about the eternal, right? That even when we make it about the internal and who we are, that there can be something very self-obsessed about that as well. That when you take the view of eternity, the need to live for eternity out of the mix, we will always run amok in our value system and our identity as well. The answer is not to focus more on ourselves, but less, and to know what our focus is. That seems so simple, but that is so profound. 
that we walk around regularly saying, oh, I got to take better care of myself. I got to focus more on myself. What do you and I mean by that? And where is there validity to how we steward our lives? And when does that become a self-obsession or a self-possession in how we care for ourselves? What does it look like? And here's where I hope the rest of the day can move. What does it look like to say, I'm going to reject a certain image and I'm going to move towards a better one?